Hello, my name is Hannah Nugent, and today I'll be talking about infrastructure and highway issues within the United States. So a brief overview, uh, like I said, we're going to be talking about infrastructure issues in the United States. Uh, we'll be talking about gentrification and the displacement of people, uh, similarities to all U.S. cities, how they all look like and why that's an issue, uh, and the lack of walkable cities in the United States, and then the United States highway system, which really ties into everything. Uh, the main audience will be those directly affected who live in the cities who are displaced or who aren't able to walk where they need to go, and then the government officials who end up making these decisions and a quick disclaimer, I'm not a professional. I'm just sharing my research. Obviously, all these topics can go into way more depth, but this is just a brief overview of those topics. So for a little bit of background, gentrification. Gentrification is a na neighborhood changes that often include economic change and, com and commonly disinvested communities. Uh, so this image to the right is an example of gentrification. Uh, so higher income residents move in and can cause change in e uh, education level or racial makeup of the residents and then causes direct uh, displacement of the people. And I'll explain that further. Uh, in this image, we have two uh, modern day apartments in surrounding a smaller, which could be considered more rundown um, home in the middle and with all these buildings surrounding them, um, making the area around it a higher income area, it's directly affecting that family living in that home. And um, then we're going to talk about the similarities of U.S. cities. So major cities in the United States look very similar all across the world. I mean, all across the uh, country. It's a lack of originality and uniqueness in each city and takes away from the excitement and the individuality of each city. And uh, that's supposed to say lack. Lack of walkable cities. It is not easy to walk around town. Um, cars are very needed. We are a very car dependent country. Highways are essential because of this. And then we'll also take a look at, uh, talk about alternatives, alternatives in other countries that exist. And then the highway system says they're 67 years old this year, created by President Eisenhower through the Federal uh, Aid Highway Act of 1956. And um, majority of highways go straight through many major cities in the United States, which cause many issues. So first we're going to talk about gentrification. It, like I said, it's the displacement of persons due to neighborhood changes. Lower income people of color are most commonly directly affected by this, and it's mainly in major cities. Neighborhoods change to fit upper to middle class, traditionally white people's wants, which, like I said, directly affects those original people who are living there. Um, we're talking about redlining and white flight and how they're directly impacted as well. Um, and this directly affects highway systems too. Like I said, highway systems really tie into all of this. And I found a brief video from the Urban Displacement uh, Project, I believe is what they're called. Um, so I will play a little bit of that in, and they'll be able to explain more. To understand it, there are three key things to consider the historic conditions, especially policies and practices that made communities susceptible to gentrification, the way that central city disinvestment and investment patterns are taking place today as a result of these conditions, and the ways that gentrification impacts communities. Over the last century, many policies and practices have created racialized patterns of disinvestment in city centers that have left low-income communities of color particularly susceptible to gentrification. From the 1930s through the late 60s, standards set by the federal government and carried out by banks explicitly labeled neighborhoods home to predominantly people of color as risky and unfit for investment. This practice, now known as redlining, meant that people of color were denied access to loans that would enable them to buy or repair homes in their neighborhood. Other housing and transportation policies of the mid 20th century fueled the growth of mostly white suburbs and the exodus of capital from urban centers in a phenomenon often referred to as white flight. Take the GI Bill as an example. The program guaranteed low cost mortgage loans for returning World War II soldiers, but discrimination limited the extent to which black veterans were able to purchase homes in the growing suburbs. In fact, the Federal Housing Administration largely required that suburban developers agree to not sell houses to Black people in order for the developers to access these guaranteed loans. Mm -hmm. Left behind in central city neighborhoods, low-income households and communities of color bore the brunt of highway system expansion and urban renewal programs, which resulted in the mass clearance of homes, businesses, and neighborhood institutions, and set the stage for widespread public and private disinvestment in the decades that followed. 
In more recent history, the foreclosure crisis also contributed to neighborhood level vulnerability to gentrification. In low-income communities of color, disproportionate levels of subprime lending resulted in mass foreclosure, leaving those neighborhoods vulnerable to investors seeking to purchase and flip homes in bulk. So I felt like that video did a really good job of describing the direct effects of gentrification. So it has a lot to do with racism. It is directly, like I said, directly affects people of color. Um, and I have a quote here. Well, let me go back really quick. Um, that video showed a local example of Cincinnati and their highway systems um, and how the highway system directly affected those people living there and how that is an, highways are an example of gentrification. And then I found a research project, peer review research project about gentrification in Cincinnati. And I have a quote from that that says, between 2010 and 2016, the white population of neighborhoods increased substantially and the rising cost of living likely caused some displacement of the incumbent African-American population. Track 74, which has something to do with the census, African-American population declined by a further 44.9% between 2010 and 2016, leaving it with only a 21.3% African-American composition. So again, this shows a local example of how gentrification affects people, especially people of color. And the next topic we're gonna to be talking about is the similarity of US cities. In almost every city you go to in the United States, buildings look the same, nothing really stands out. Within the past two months, um, I've been to both Charlotte and Atlanta, and the entire time I just kept thinking about how similar they look to Cincinnati. Um, nothing really stood out um, in w involving infrastructure. Nothing really stood out. Um, of course, they have their each of their uniquenesses and parks and things like that, but the buildings all look the same. The entire time I was there, I kept saying to myself, "Oh, I feel like I'm I'm in Cincinnati right now because it looks so similar." Um, and then the same with modern apartments. They look identical everywhere. This photo here is from Bloomberg. Um, and I believe they are apartments in Texas. And of course, so they all have their, uh, their, each of them have their own uniqueness, but they look eerily similar, each of them, the way they are structured. Um, and according to Bloomberg, this is due to cheap disposable apartment materials and unskilled workers. So these buildings are quick and easily built. And the people who uh, are building them get people in and out quickly just to make money. So these buildings are just okay standards. And so this is purely uh, through economic interest opposed to the consumer interest. Um, and so modern buildings were interesting at first, but now they are boring and overused and it's constantly all you see. Uh, there's a lack of uniqueness in most of the country. Obviously, there's different parts of the country and small amounts that have their own uniqueness, like the Space Needle in um, Washington, Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. Each uh, state really has something unique to themselves, but when it comes to the buildings and how things are built, everything really looks similar. If you um, go to, and I feel like there's a lot of countries in the world where you can go, oh yeah, that building is from there because you recognize the infrastructure there. But United States, everything looks the same. Like I don't really feel as if there's a type of building that is unique to the state of Ohio that you can't find in California. Um, I feel like towards the South, there's a little bit more of unique buildings in the way that they're built. Um, but this is like in the deep, deep South near the border. Um, and down in Florida, but even then you can find some of those types of buildings up here um, in the north. So there's not really uniqueness in buildings within the United States. Lack of walkable cities. Uh, so this photo shows a neighborhood and a um, sidewalk that, that stops halfway through and then the other side doesn't even have a sidewalk. Um, so there's parking lots everywhere throughout America because we are a automobile dependent country where we prioritize cars and traveling long distances in order to get places. So there's a large lack of sidewalks. Now in comparison to Europe, and of course Europe isn't all walkable, but compared to many countries in Europe, um, especially major cities, people are able to walk everywhere. 15 minutes down the street, they're able to go from their home to a grocery store, whereas that's not really possible here unless you live in certain cities, like big cities, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, and this is also affects affordable housing. So there's social socially vulnerable citizens who need to walk, but don't have much space to do so. If they're able to afford a house that they find, they may not be able to afford a car and they have to walk in order to get to their job or to the grocery store, but that's not always possible because there's a large um, distance between the two and lack of sidewalk. Of course, like I said, big cities 
um, in America it can be exceptions such as New York, San Francisco, Chicago, but there's other places um, like LA, of course, down, down, downtown LA, you're able to walk to, but the rest of it is not very walkable. Or if I wanted to walk from Oxford, Ohio to Hamilton, Ohio, that is not at all, at all a possibility because there's not a sidewalk for me to do so. And then the highway systems, like I said, this ties into everything. Uh, this here is an image from Vox that shows a major U.S. city. I'm not sure which one, but there is a highway system going directly through it. Um, so like I said, many major U.S. Uh, highways run straight through large cities. Um, I found an article that described uh, the construction as a tornado path or atomic bomb um, through these cities. Huge displacement factors when they are first made directly impacted low-income people of color. Like I mentioned earlier, this is an example of gentrification. Uh, it adds to the lack of walkability to the country. So because we are so dependent on those highway systems to get from one place to another, it cuts out walkability. Uh, and while it, it does connect different metro metropolitan areas, um, we have to think about the costs of what that affects at the end of the day. So I have possible solutions. Um, of course, it's gonna be very difficult to fix much of this considering our country is already very well developed, but um, there are some things possibly. So here I have an image from Fox 19 uh, News from Cincinnati that says new plans revealed for Tri-County Mall redevelopment. Uh, so this was a shopping mall. People parked around it and then had to go inside. Um, but now they are redesigning it to make it almost like a tiny walkable city is what I would describe it as. Uh, so uh, pedestrian centered areas. So um, there aren't cars. You can just drive through that city. It's just a large group of people walking around throughout the mall or through the apartments or whatever will be uh, whatever, whatever will be included within the Tri-County Mall. Um, so the lack of car-centric malls and strip malls um, would be able to help over time. Obviously, that is a very small thing and people aren't going to live in malls. You obviously have to drive to get to this said mall, but this is a small step in the right direction. Um, I Obviously, like in this... Um, I think it's AI generated photo. You see people walking throughout it. So that's um, a good improvement. Um, this topic of gentr gentrification and improve area around without displacing the people. So the money that would be used in order to build these new buildings and to uh, change the income of the area could be relocated to help those people in the area to make it better for them so they can continue living there and they aren't displaced. Um, then investing in quality infrastructure, obviously, to make new apartments because there's so many people that need them. Make it quick and easy is the easy way out. But, but to invest in good quality infrastructure, um, I think would be a good move. And then railway systems. Um, again, going back to Europe, uh, I uh, railway systems and trains um, are very popular in the country and people are able to go back and forth. But uh, if you're not in a major city like New York or Chicago, there aren't really trains for you to transport on. Um, so the creation of railway systems would be able to help with that as well. So I think that would be a really great idea. It would add just public transportation in general would help a lot. So we wouldn't be as car dependent, we're able to uh, travel together, which could at the end of the day, create more uh, walk sidewalks for people um, to travel on. Thank you.